So as we were talking now, you could see this running. Now, uh, Richard, what is it? It's an Ericsson engine. It's a hot air engine and it turns the heat from this copper into mechanical energy. There's a power, a, a, a big displacer piston at the bottom. It's a power piston here and they're at 90 degrees. And this was, uh, this was a present and it's a lovely thing and it just fascinates people and what I do is take this into uh, when I'm doing a lecture I ask people to estimate how long it's going to run for on one cup of tea. It's exactly as I thought. Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now how do you move the bullet train from Japan to the north of England? What do you do when somebody wants a replica for the engine on the SS Great Britain? And what happens when the potato peeling machine stops working when you're at sea on the Australia run and the crew are without chips? Well in today's video you're going to find out. So here we are in Richard's study and to begin I'm going to say uh, the title So You Want to Be a Mechanical Engineer was stolen from one of your talks. Mm -hmm. Now what does that title mean and on the back of that what kind of engineer are you? Right okay so I, I, I designed the talk to try and sort out whether the audience were of the right material to be a mechanical engineer. I, I believe strongly that engineers need certain qualities and the idea of that talk was to put questions and difficulties to them to see how they behaved. And over the course of this discussion we're going to see how you behaved with regards to <laughs> this in your own projects I guess. But uh, what, what kind of engineer are you? I'm a practical engineer, I'm a graduate engineer, I'm most definitely a mechanical engineer um, and I'd like to think that I'd been reasonably successful. Well I'll tell you what we'll talk through these projects and the audience can decide for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so you're starting engineering tell the audience how that came about. Well uh, my father and mother were not practical people um, but could see that I was desperate to be making things, fixing things all my life. I'd been like that and, and they wanted to encourage that. Okay. Um, and they encouraged that by allowing me to have a workshop in the cellar of yeah. the house where we grew up. Um, and at some point they decided to send you to Cheltenham Boys School. Yes. What happened there? Well, public schools are places where sport counts very highly. I'm useless at sport, always have been, um, and I didn't do very well at the school in terms of success until I discovered that there was a mechanical engineering workshop and I realised that that's what I really wanted to do in spite of mm -hmm. being useless at sport. Yeah. You were allowed to do engineering if you were useless at sport. So uh, you're off the cricket team, but you made the engineering team. Yes. Now you decide you want to do some machining, but you don't have a lathe. No, I don't. I don't. I, we have a wonderful machine uh, kit at school, and I want to have something at home so I can make things. And you speak to the engineering teacher? Who was an inspirational man. And one of my great regrets is that we didn't go back and, and thank him. But he said, well, if you need a lathe, why don't you make one? Make one. So I did some drawings and set off to make my first lathe. And this is a simple lathe, um, yes. I believe, a piece of angle iron for the bed. Yes. Um, yes. And, and we had it machined at a local engineering uh, place to get a flat top and um, then a plain headstock, plain bearings, uh, forge your self-centering chuck and then I needed an electric motor. Mm. My father was useless at DIY but very keen to help. Um, he managed to find a quarter horsepower motor and 
with great difficulty made a mounting for this motor to drive the lathe that I'd made at school. So you got going and on the lathe? Producing loads of swarf which was tramping through the house yeah. much to my father and mother's disgust. Um, but anyway I made my first locomotive. So you built the lathe and built a locomotive on yes. it? Yes and, and uh, there was no stopping me and, and the, th the thrill that I got from making things um, during my early teens has stayed with me ever since. And moving on from that, with that all behind you, you decide to go down the A-level and degree route. But yes, but it was, it was a, in conjunction with Salford University and it, it was an apprenticeship with Metropolitan Vickers in Trafford Park. Yeah. And what that enabled me to do was to have five years of practical um, tuition on the shop floor and mix that with uh, degree level um, theoretical subjects. So on the shop floor then, you start in? I start in Trafford Park when I'm 18. Okay. And, uh, and what sort of size factory is this? This is uh, 30,000 employees under one roof. Wow. It was called AEI, Associated Electrical Industries, and they made turbine generators. Right. And so that involved everything from foundry to... Uh, machining. M big machining, fabrication, and it was a huge works. And we were able to get every different skill throughout that five years. Yeah. So tell us about the foundry wheelbarrows. Yes. So one of the jobs of the uh, trainees was to assist the Irishmen who were, whose job was to feed the cupolas. They were making 30 ton castings every day, big castings, and the um, iron, it was SG iron, and the iron was melted by uh, feeding scrap iron and uh, uh, pig iron into the furnace with coke and um, limestone. And these cupolas were about six foot diameter, there were three of them, and we as youngsters had to fill the barrows with coke, limestone and scrap iron and then run with the barrows at the cupola door and a barrow has a hoop at the front and what you had to do was as you got to the cupola you engaged the front of the barrow and then threw it up and the handles banged against the door and the load went into the cupola. Hopefully. Uh, and sometimes the barrow ho the, the hoop at the front would miss and the whole barrow <laughs> tire and everything would go in Yeah. And nobody bothered, they just carried on. It's fine, it's Get fine. Get another wheelbarrow. <laughs> so, following that, a bit of time in the machine shop. Yes. And tell us about the young lady called Doreen. Oh, gosh, yes. Okay, so there, there was a drawing office, and, and in the drawing office there were tracers, and the tracers would be drawing the uh, beautiful line drawings on the linen, and I fancied this girl called Doreen who was a tracer and I was at the lathe section and the lathes uh, were just in the main factory aisle and there was a guy called Harold who was the universal fixer. He just fixed everything for everybody and I'd stupidly mentioned that I fancied Doreen and he said what you need to do is just go out to her when she, co when she comes through the uh, uh, work workshop tonight and just go up to her and say I'm Richard that Harold has talked about and of course Harold hadn't done any such thing Harold was lying through his teeth and what happened was that I went up to Doreen as she was walking out to clock up clock out at uh, five minutes to five and I walked up and I said I'm Richard that Harold's talked to you about and she said go away I have no idea who you are. <laughs> so oh. I, I then learned that people weren't being entirely honest. That was the end of Doreen. That was the end of Doreen. But Harold did have his own uh, comeuppance. He did. So Harold was a machinist in the gear shop and these were big uh, steel gears, turbine reduction gears, 
um, and often it took a fortnight for the cut to go down the hole of the Gear height bank. of the gear. So we've got the hob turning round yeah. and we've got the wheel turning round slowly on a turntable, all in time obviously, hobbing away. They were David Brown machine, uh, gear cutting machines. And the drive that drove the hobbing mechanism down was a separate motor on the top and then the turntable turned in, in line with it. And you couldn't see the thing moving and one day Harold left his machine not turning but feeding. So the machine's off but the drive's still on. And everyone's at home and the bed, the uh, hobbing head comes down and meets over the weekend, meets the bed and splits this machine mm. and the whole thing was lying back on Monday morning and Harold got the sack. Well there we are. Skipping towards the end of your apprenticeship, you mm. spend the last six months uh, erecting Egra Power Station. I was really interested in uh, machines that turn and, and I wanted to be involved with that side of it. With, with Well really with running machinery and I was involved in the construction of Egbra and that was a, a big job. There were four 500 megawatt sets all gone now of course but um, when we got to the end of the uh, er erection period which was 18 months I came out of my apprenticeship and so was actually employed at Egborough as a, a night supervisor and when the turbines came when the first turbine set came to run for the first time there were a crowd of us there and it was a really important moment in my life because suddenly something that you'd been working on for a long time um, came to fruition and the, 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 the thing ran up to speed and there were all sorts of frequencies and vibrations and eventually it got up to speed and synchronized at 3000 rpm so this is a, a, a 200 foot shaft with 18 foot diameter wheels spinning at 3000 rpm it's quite something and it was very impressive to me as a youngster and I was standing next to the shop steward who was from Nottingley and <laughs> Bill Robert, Bill Robert Robertson I think his name was. Anyway, he, I just turned to him and said, look at that, just feel the power and he said, power you know nothing, I could have all this lot out on strike in just five minutes by blowing my whistle. That's power boy. That's power. <laughs> <laughs> So you get the bug for running machinery? I do, yes. And, and I went to the company in Trafford Park and I said I'd really like to be involved in, in commissioning and running. And they said, with no vacancies, why don't you join the Merchant Navy and go and see the world and get it all out of your system and come back to us. Get uh, what exactly out of your system? Get this obsession with running machinery oh, right. out of my system, and I suppose that has been one of my obsessions. Things yes. that run. Perhaps you need to join the Merchant Navy again. I'm not <laughs> sure it's fully left, has it? <laughs> so you joined the Merchant Navy. So I joined the Merchant Navy. The Blue Funnel Line was based in Birkenhead, yeah, and they sailed all over the world with refrigerated cargo ships, mm -hmm. and and this is a big fleet. 80 ships. 80 ships. Um, um, they were diesel, um, diesel ships and uh, steam ships. And so I sailed on both types of ship mm -hmm. um, and had wonderful experience because you live like a king because they were passenger ships. Yeah. But there's no passengers anymore. Mm -hmm. So the, the crew, are li the officers are living like lords really. Right. Lovely food. Uh, uniform every day but uh, and a strong sense of discipline and we sailed all over the world and your role on these ships was, was? a junior engineer mm -hmm. so you're an assistant you're very much in a as a rubbing rag and I was the only graduate in the whole fleet which yeah. was quite interesting but anyway that's that's beside the point and and we we did you worked with a senior officer so the the, the the seventh, as I was, worked with the second engineer all the time. So you did four on, eight off, four on, eight off, all the time. And what happened on one occasion was that the 
uh, second engineer just suddenly was galvanized and he heard this noise on one of the cylinders and he just threw the stop lever over, stopped the engine, the ship stops, it's a single screw ship, the ship stops, the lights go out, everything's stopped, off. off and you're in darkness and he says he heard something fall so everyone's ringing up and playing hell with him and in the end we had to set to with the ship sort of drifting about drifting about strip the the crankcase of the cylinder that he heard the noise and the the big end sorry the little end nut which was about an eight inch across flats castellated nut the fact come out and the nut had come off and was just sitting on one of the shelves inside the engine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely the right thing to do. And that taught me a good lesson. So we stopped the ship and saved the engine? Yes. Based on hearing it fall off? Yes. Yeah. And what about your triumph with the uh, chips? <laughs> right. So we're on the Australia run this time. Very different thing. This is a steamship. And this is on the ship we can see here. Yes. The, the Jason and that was a, a steamship refrigerated cargo again um, and what happened there was that the kitchen is providing food for the crew and for everyone on board because there's deck officers as well but the mm -hmm. deck officers don't really talk to the engineers right. it's a hierarchy deck officers see themselves as above the engineers and the uh, potato rumbling machine which took the potatoes and spun them round in, a, in a, a drum about the size of a dustbin with a rough inside and it was driven by an, a DC electric motor with a uh, phosphor bronze gear which stripped about a fortnight out from Birkenhead and we knew we had the prospect of four months at sea with no peeled potatoes. No chips. So, <laughs> so, so I, I said to Big Mouth and said I can do that, I can fix that. And and I took the stripped gear, which was... Bearing in mind on the ship, they've only got a lathe. A lathe and a drilling machine yeah. and a, and a and file. And you said you're going to make a helical gear. And I said, I, I'll have a go. And the second engineer said, oh, clever Dick, let's see him do it. So what I did was to get a new blank and put it on a shaft with the stripped gear and then I, I had the two of them together in the lathe uh, going backwards and forwards with a, a shaping tool travelling yeah. horizontally with the carriage and I planed new gears, new teeth quite crudely using the root of the strip gear as a guide oh, right. and I planed a new gear which gave us three weeks of potatoes after which that too croaked but it was a it was a <laughs> it was a victory yeah a so, pyrrhic victory so you decided to return to shore yes i wanted to get married and i needed to settle down and i'd had this incredible experience of running machinery and sorting yeah. things out yeah i got a job with ferodo who made brakes yeah who made Breaking brakes clutches. And I was originally given a really boring job, which was deciding on how the lorries were loaded mm -hmm. from the factory to the depots. Right. But then suddenly I got asked to join this quite dynamic project team because the technical director had uh, created this thing called a retarder, which was to go on the prop shaft of the vehicle. And it was an oil immersed brake, which would provide braking power for the lorry. Yeah on continuous hills without wearing the brakes out or overheating them. Okay, so um, that, and that was quite a long project? Yes, that went on for four years and it ended up with us making uh, these retarders which were fitted to Leyland Leopard coaches and it ended up with Leyland buying the whole project out. And that was you out of a job? Well, by that time I'd already decided I could see the writing on the wall okay. and I needed to go somewhere else. So And so in comes your first venture into large steam and museum yes. pieces. So, yes, so Sheffield City Council wanted to um, move the River Don steam engine, which is 440 tonnes yeah. and is huge. It's three cylinders, uh, 40, 48 inch stroke, 
40 inch bore. Yeah. And um, you said, I can move that. Well, I don't <laughs> think I did. I, I applied for the job, yeah. scared stiff. And and I, I, we went for interview in Sheffield Town Hall. We, we had to have good table manners. It mattered in those days that the officers who worked for Sheffield City Council yeah. had to have good manners. So we were entertained to lunch in the top, the sort of knobs dining room. And there was one guy there who was particularly up. One of well, there were six of us who for were shortlisted. Yeah. And I was in for this job, and and this one guy, when he got us together after the um, initial um, lunch, we were in the room waiting to go in for interview, and this guy said, "I don't know why you lot have bothered coming along here, because if I don't get the job, they don't get the bloody engine." Ma. On tactic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we got, I was interviewed, it was a semicircular table and I was interviewed by six officers from Sheffield City Council. And they all had their questions, they got to the end of the interview and they said, is there anything you want to ask us? And I thought, now is my chance to do for this guy. So I said, yes, I want to know if it's true that if Brian doesn't get the job, you don't get the engine <laughs> and there was total silence it was a wonderful moment and they said uh, we'll talk about this separately outside the meeting but it was a magic moment and he didn't get the job and i did you got the job mm. so you moved this engine so uh, it was my job to let the engine come across it was dismantled in so the a, uh, 430 tons yes twelve thousand horsepower yes and you've got to get it out of a factory move it to a museum and install it and get it running and install it and get I, it running I didn't dismantle it, the, the team of contractors dismantled it okay. but I learnt so much there because it was all about doing things without exactly the proper tackle yes and, and, and perhaps as an example of that the bed plates uh, the side of the engine on which the A-frame sat 40 tonnes we had a 15 ton crane in the roof. How are we going to get these objects off the lorry and erected in the, in the, on the bed plate, which the, the, they'd made a beautiful new foundation. And, and this lovely Irishman, who, who was the guy in charge of the, the move, he, he taught me so much. He's the man who said, the willing man will find a way, which has become... Which has been one of Richard's um, and yours. catchphrases. And yours. The willing man will find a way. So, we, what, what he showed me was that with a 15 ton crane you could lift one end of a 40 ton casting. Right. Not really, but he, he used to say, <laughs> the crane's tested to 50% above, so we can break the rules. So we dragged the bed plate off the lorry and then to get it into the hole what he did was to get the crane on one end and then put a load of pallets in the pit at the other wooden <laughs> pallets stack them up and then drag the bed plate off and as it fell it smashed the pallets and then right. used jacks to get rid of the timber <laughs> underneath and, and he did it luckily we haven't had to try that out when moving a bridge port yet <laughs> Um, no, anyway, so, you know, people like that filled me with admiration and, yeah. and that stayed with me all my life. Yeah, and uh, on that topic, I'll introduce the audience to another one of your phrases for <laughs> other types of people and that is the one of the Wibbier. Oh, oh. Yes, we've shared this joke, um, but all my life I've been surrounded, sometimes well and sometimes badly, by Wibbiers. Wouldn't it be better if you and then they go into their diatribe about <laughs> how, you, how you're doing it all wrong. Yeah. So there were a lot of Wibbiers. I suppose there were a lot of Wibbiers all my life. I've been surrounded by Wibbiers. You seem Wibbiers. to have had your fair share of them. Yes. Yeah. But so, so will you. So, yeah, <laughs> possible. <laughs> so that was your time at Sheffield. Yep. And that led you to what you've described as the best job in the world. Yes. Which was the Chief Engineer of the National Railway Museum. In York. In York. 
and I just saw this and I thought this is what I've been living for yeah and it was the best job in the world now we'll come on to these opportunities but it's worth mentioning while we're on the topic of people that at the NRM workshop you also had your fair share of wind ups <laughs> certainly did and uh, I'll mention a few of them uh, these are from your staff and colleagues yes. in the mostly in the workshop all in the workshop yes it was a good team we worked we worked hard and we played hard yeah so how about for instance the time you had to move a victorian cast iron railway bridge um yes so there's a bridge at percy main which is the cast iron bridge yeah uh, that is erected in the great hall yeah and it was very difficult because uh, when you are putting together something that's cast, if it's steel and you put it together and you plot load against extension, you get the elastic limit and you can measure that. With cast iron, it doesn't do that. Right. With cast iron, it snaps mm -hmm. when it gets to the critical point. And we erated this bridge and then the people who were looking after the health and safety at the Heisel Stadium, where there had been a very famous accident, they came and said, this bridge, this 1905 cast iron bridge must be tested to 50% overload, and which is the equivalent of 400 people standing on the arch. So we took this poor old bridge, cast iron, that we'd put together and we put weights on it and gradually loaded it up and I mean we had a dial gauge underneath which is ridiculous when you think about it because if it had collapsed we'd have been in real trouble and when we came in in the morning ready to do the test there was a crack in the arch of the bridge and you thought and, and I <laughs> well I didn't know that my staff had been up in the night with a ladder and had painted this crack <laughs> with a felt, black felt tip pen right through the main structural arch. So you arrived ready for the test and think you're about to lose your job? I did, yes, because the museum was nearly finished then. And it turns out it's the paint shop at their old tricks again. Yes, it was. Now yes. the paint shop had quite a few old tricks up their sleeve. The, yes, the, the, they certainly did. So the paint shop did all sorts of wind-ups. We were living on one of the main roads out of out of York and suddenly uh, we were lived in a lovely uh, uh, terraced Victorian house with a long garden and unknown to me the, the workshop staff suddenly rolled up one day and knocked at the door I wasn't there bear in mind and they said to my wife we're the engineering team from Richard's work. We've come to measure up for the garden railway. And the one thing Angela had said is, we are not having a garden railway. And so she rang me up and said, I've got all the blokes here, is it right? <laughs> anyway, that was one of the things. They did another thing. Because it was on the main road out of York, they wanted to have, uh, the council wanted speed cameras because there was a traffic problem. And I suddenly got a, a, a formal letter through the post from York City Council saying that my front garden had been chosen as the site for the, one of the speed cameras and this was fine. I would be given a, a concession of £50 a year but what I had to do was to keep the films changed no matter what time of night or day and that if the camera ran out of film <laughs> when I had not done it then I would be fined yeah. and this letter went progressively more and more ridiculous until I realized it had to come from the blokes at work yeah. it was the paint shop again <laughs> paint shop now to finish on the paint shop you were awarded an OBE for your services to museums yes I was you already had a fairly sizable title anyway now what did the paint shop do <sighs> Just to uh, so show. I had a, an office uh, up on the top corridor where the officers of the, they were called officers, it's ridiculous, but where the senior people went. And when I got into work, having been awarded the OBE on the next Monday morning, the doors on the top corridor opened inwards, right? And you had a little label on your door saying, R. Gibbon. And when I came in on Monday morning, there was a mahogany sign that was about three foot six long <laughs> that was screwed to the door so firmly, of course, that you couldn't open the door. 
because the Richard Gibbon OBE BSC God knows what was longer than the door and I couldn't get in but I didn't photograph it I wish I, wish I had yeah. done so some more serious projects at the museum yeah you were given the task or someone said we need to get the bullet train from Japan and you said I'll do it well I did what happened was that the um, the, the museum decided that a, a Japanese bullet train was going to be an important exhibit, one of the world important uh, steps. And so we had to go out to Japan and supervise loading it up and then bring it to York. Bring it to York. Now, there was an issue with money, wasn't there? And who stepped in? Um, BBC Leeds stepped in and said, we'd like to film this uh, Richard doing the bullet train but the deal is if it goes wrong we keep filming because the museum couldn't afford to send me to Japan to yeah. just as they saw it have a jolly loading up the bullet train yeah and and the BBC to be fair were very good they they said we'll cover it yeah and we went out to Japan and loaded it up and so it came in how did moving it across Japan go that was lovely because they're very, very professional. Moving it at our end was a very different matter because what we had to do was to move it across the, the railway network in, in the UK. And we need to explain here that the bullet train is, is four foot eight and a half. It's the standard British gauge, yeah. but the body is on steroids because yeah. the Japanese are used to narrow gauge. Mm -hmm. So this vehicle is nearly three and a half feet wider than anything that travels on Britain's railways. Yeah. So to get it from where it came off the road transport into the railway museum meant that they had to take down Network Rail were brilliant. They had to take down 29 signals um, with signs, speed restriction signs, point motors, God knows what. And we identified the ball and then um, on the night when it was coming round they, there was a team dismantling the uh, objects off the railway and then mantling them yeah. again afterwards. Remantling them. As remantling them. So they went down and as they were rolling. And we had a, a, a diesel locomotive at the front and a diesel locomotive at the back. Yeah. And eventually it came into the museum. Stop him. Now the chances are that when the wheel goes up on the wood it's going to go all over the place. So let's go for it. Right, ready. What we want is, is you, Malcolm, very carefully steering that other piece of wood, but getting out of the way. Malcolm, be very careful. Just leave it. Don't try anything clever. I'll just give him another inch of clearance. That's lovely. OK, now he can take a run at it. Yeah, bring him on. The willing man found a way, and to anyone that visits the railway museum, the bullet train's still there. It is, yeah. and, and it's a brilliant piece of engineering, 1960s engineering. Yeah, so just to conclude this topic on the NRM briefly, you arranged a rerun of the Rainhill Trials, so you had a lot yes. to do with Stevenson's Rocket and the Rainhill Trials. Was this another TV programme? It's a, the BBC TV programme, and they wanted to rerun the Rainhill Trials with the replica machines and right. they commissioned us to, to do it. So you built a well, rocket? Or, or no, there was a replica oh, rocket, there was, there was a replica Samparai and there was a replica novelty. The yeah. replica novelty was in Sweden, so we had to go over to Sweden, get the replica novelty and yeah. then get it running, mm -hmm. which it hadn't done. Um, and so we re-ran the Rainhill trials and of course Rocket won, but the TV producer didn't like that result and thought that Samparai was a much more exciting engine than Rocket and how lovely it would be to change the course of history. Right. So we had a massive row having got these three engines to rerun the Rainhill Trials and repeated the uh, 1929 result. We did, did it how it should have been and the TV people didn't like it. So we had a massive row, and in the end, we won that. We won that one yeah. because Rocket was the better locomotive, and of course, set the the trend for the next two hundred years. Yeah, and that took you to retirement. <sighs> retirement. Although, although you didn't really retire. No, 
No, I don't think I don't think engineers do you, retire. You didn't put your feet up. No, um, no, I've been busy ever since, really. The SS Great Britain came along. Yes, right. Okay, so um, the only the only one of Brunel's steamships that survived yeah. uh, had been beached at Sparrow Cove in the Falklands, and a, a wealthy businessman thought that Bristol would like. The, eng the ships, the ship that they built, back to Bristol. So af after a lot of adventure that I was nothing to do with, the SS Great Britain came back into the dock that yeah. it had been built in, mm -hmm. in Bristol. And the, uh, I think it was the Millennium Fund, uh, made money available for a set of engine, a replica set of engines. Yeah, so... You get the task of... Designing them. Designing a replica <laughs> engine. 18, 1843 uh, paddle engines. Yeah. Now the issue here is that there was no documentation of what the original engine looked like or how it no. had been designed. No. All you had to go on was... Four engravings from a man called John Wheel, who was not an engineer, who had gone onto the ship in 1844 and done sketches and then come back and produce five lithographs. And this was a, an artist, an artistic An version. artist. So when he sees a, a, a Gibb and Cotter, he doesn't know what he's really looking at. So my job was to take these plates, these uh, artist plates, and turn them into engineering drawings. Yeah. And then we had to make a replica engine, which was all smoke and mirrors, um, which weighed no more than 43 tonnes because the ship wasn't capable of carrying a full engine anymore. Full engine anymore. Yeah. So that was terrific and, and what yeah. a job. I yeah, mean, and if you go to the SS Great Britain today you can see it. Yes, and the engines turn and it's lovely. I mean, we were that was a great team and that was a huge achievement to be working on something that the great man Brunel had actually yeah. worked on was wonderful. Yeah. And moving on in your retirement, you do several other things. You write a book. Uh, oh, yes. So here we have it. You wrote a Haynes manual. So Stevenson's rocket. A bit of a joke, really, um, because Haynes obviously produce spoof things as well as really good yeah. workshop manuals. So Haynes came to me and said, can you write um, a book on Stevenson's rocket? And we'd had a lot of experience and it's not a bestseller. <laughs> but it, it is it is nevertheless and it does happen to have one page of illustrations done by mr crispin it does it does indeed. yeah thank you for that yeah so uh so um that's that also yeah. plenty of model engineering we saw in the previous video your steam crane that was an early retirement project yes yes the steam and cranes turned out to be quite important because it's unique and since then another two locomotives you've built nearly. yes Yes, I'm just about to finish my 14th locomotive. Yeah. And from my point of view, I came across you in your retirement. Yes. Did you help me prepare for my interview at Rolls-Royce? That was fantastic because I think I was dead lucky. But um, I, I went round to Crispin's house the day before he was due to go for interview. And of course, you know, it's got to be, if it's Rolls-Royce at Derby, it's got to be jet engines. So I said, do you know how a jet engine works? And, and I said, no. And I said, well, I'm not leaving here until you do. Yeah. So we discussed it and discussed it. I think it was a late night. And then you went to Rolls-Royce and they said, Crispin, can you tell us how a jet engine works? They did, yeah. And I was able to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were dead jammy with that. What's next for Richard after that? More model engineering? Oh yes, I think so. I think, I mean, model engineering is, is, is within me. I think I said earlier that the feeling I get when I, when I dream about and create the part in my head is exactly the same as when I was 16. And I, yeah. I, I really treasure that. I, yeah. think, I don't think I'm unique. There must be lots of model engineers who feel that way. Oh, well, it's not something specific to model engineering, really, is it? It's engineering. Any, any engineer really feels and, and eats and sleeps the, the part. Um, and, and it's great. Yeah. So uh, we have discussed here a range of topics that cover 70 years, if I'm right. Yes. 
yeah, 70 years in engineering, a lot of good projects, it's quite a list. Quite a few mistakes, um, quite a list of achievements, um, but I'm proud of being a mechanical engineer. It's yeah. great because I, I follow in um, the footsteps of, of important, influential people. Yeah, now I think we're uh, pretty much ready for our conclusion here, so if there's anything you'd like to add, uh, oh, Scrap Heap Challenge, we'll mention oh, yes. that. Uh, any of you who used to watch Scrap Heap Challenge may recognise Richard because you've actually made five. five appearances on Scrap Heap Challenge. Um, yes. Basically, any of the steam related ones, yes. if I'm right. They wanted, yes, they, I can't remember them all, but um, I mean, we did a lot um, and many of them were very exciting. Um, yeah. And, and we did a steam versus diesel. Um, versus electric um, and of course steam had to win yeah so i had that job to do and and i clearly remember we were staying in a hotel in in cheltenham i think it was and i realized in the middle of the night that we'd got the exhaust and the inlet of the steam engine the wrong way around right and i could I remembered from the size of the pipes that we must have got it wrong. So I had to come in the next day and the team were furious with me and we had to reverse the whole engine. Is this in the five minutes tinker time they used to give you? Five minutes, <laughs> five minutes. Well, the television people were well fed up with me because we needed to reverse the whole engine. Right. But we got it right in you the end. You did it. Yes. Found a way. Yeah, so that's 70 years. What would you like to say in conclusion? The willing man will find a way is, is the way to go on and I suppose I do, I really believe that, that you need to have a positive attitude. You've got it and I'm so proud that you and I have been able to uh, see things through together because you've got the same attitude and I love that. Well your attrition has been um, most helpful and you heard Richard say earlier that uh, he regretted he never had the chance to thank one of his mentors so I'm going to surprise you here now I'm a bit ill prepared in this I've not got anything to present you with but I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you for the help you've given me over the years because oh, nice. it's made a big difference to my life and engineering career so that's all from us here we'll return to the workshop and thank you Richard for doing this thank you this is the River Don rolling mill engine for rolling armour plate and on one occasion 40 visitors from the French uh, Midi came on a visit and none of them spoke any English and I said I'll do it in my best O-level French without having much of a clue so I addressed this party of 40 and described it as set grand machine à vapeur which is a large steam engine pour faire l'amour, to make armour. And they all started laughing and I had no idea why until somebody afterwards came up and said, you've told them it's a 12,000 horsepower machine for making love. <laughs> this is the Jason and the engine room is deep down somewhere here. And of course I was building a model locomotive when we were on the Australia run and I got into big trouble because one day uh, the second engineer found out that I was flat bottoming grinding the, some of the drills to make flat bottom holes and he said to me don't you ever flat bottom a drill because one day that drill might be needed to save someone's life and you will have messed it up by building your wretched locomotive. Now we talked about the paint shop at the NRM, <laughs> uh, what's this plaque you're holding? This is the paint shop once again, this is a locomotive headboard to go on the front of a steam locomotive and this was because whenever my department wanted me I was always in Japan or at a meeting or so they got so fed up with it that they christened me the remote spearheader and this name board was on all sorts of trains that 
really shouldn't have been. They were a lovely bunch of blokes, but a bit naughty. So if you ever visited the NRM and saw a locomotive called the Remote Spearheader, it's actually, me. It's Richard. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard, for having me. And thank you, Richard, for talking the audience through those things. I'm sure they enjoyed it. Now, at the beginning of this video, Richard mentioned that there were certain traits that he believed were important for anyone wanting to be a mechanical engineer. Now, following the video, I asked him, what are they? And his answer was as follows. Curiosity, enthusiasm, doggedness, the ability to be the grit in the oyster and say things that sometimes people don't want to hear, and also to know when you have met your match. And that's an interesting one because the willing man will find a way is a great motto to live by once you are doing something, but perhaps the ability to know when you've met your match is equally as important in the first onset when looking at a challenge. So apart from that, all I have to say is thank you for watching. I hope you found this interesting and see you on the next video.